便利なものでしょうこの尻尾は<笑>こちらにも好都合だsupervisor during the future Trunks arc. But I want to kick things off by talking about the storyboard of this episode. It comes from another veteran of Dragon Ball, Naoto Shishida. We of course all know him for his exceptional animation, but his contributions to the tournament so far have mainly come in storyboard form. They have been excellent though, and this one is no exception. The opening scenes that focus on small aspects of each character are framed so wonderfully, all of the focal points are on anything but the characters' faces, and this is something I've noticed was quite common during build-ups back on Dragon Ball Z. For example, the moments before Goku and Piccolo take on Raditz focus on little parts of the surrounding environment. In conjunction with the music, or lack thereof, it helps create this calm before the storm feeling that does wonders for building tension. Another part of Shida's board that's so critical to the success of this episode is something I've touched on just about every single time he's done one of these things. The way he links action scenes together is really just unrivaled by most of the other storyboarders on the series. You very rarely get plain old hard cuts between each fighter in a battle. For example, when Vegeta enters the battle, it happens through him zooming past Goku in the background. When it's time for a focus on Freezer following Vegeta being blown up, he enters by blowing through that aftermath smoke. When Toppo attacks Gohan, 17 shown through his disrupting key blast. All of these transitions feel remarkably seamless, which is great for making this feel like one cohesive battle. In a lot of weaker storyboards, you'll find that often the transitions feel like flicking through a spectator in a game. You're kind of just swapping between viewpoints with no real sense of where the battles are taking place. To nail the flow of a large battle like this is no easy feat, so this board gets two thumbs up, especially with all of the dramatic close-ups thrown in. Shida mentioned he'd be back with his own key animation at some point soon, so it sounds like we're in for another treat before the tournament ends. Hopefully it's a little more animated than his recent contributions. So let's touch on animation then. This episode is split up into three sections. Ni supervises the first half of part A, Nashizawa does the second, and then Takahashi powers through part B. I have to say, I am totally blown away by Ni's artwork in this episode. There are several shots that I could have sworn were by Takahashi, but they match Ni's traits from the previous episodes, albeit with a far more old school touch. If Ni is taking cues from what Takahashi is doing, then he's definitely going to become one of the newest supervisors to keep an eye on in the future. His corrections in his previous episodes have always been pretty strong, but nothing quite to this caliber. It is seriously impressive. Unfortunately, the animation, the movement in his section isn't quite as strong. Aside from being corrected by the chief supervisor, Miyako Suji, the actual movement is a little bizarre. Goku and Jiren's dialogue scene mid-battle is probably the worst offender. They're throwing punches back and forth, but their torsos don't actually move. It all feels a bit stiff and awkward, especially after such a grand build-up. Bizarrely, there are instances of Shida's distinctive smoke in sections of this half. While his work from episode 110 does get reused later in the episode, I can't recall any of these particular drawings ever being in Super before. I don't know if someone's just imitating him or if he did some uncredited drawings here. It's very strange though, definitely welcome. As Goku kicks Jiren out of the 
the way Nashizawa's section of this half begins. If you're big into very angular work, then Nashizawa's style is 100% for you. You've got razor sharp hair on all of the characters, very pointy noses, even on Jiren, and extremely sharp shading. Nashizawa's great at just about every single angle, aside from front on shots. I'm sure I've covered this in his previous episodes, but for some reason, as soon as you make him draw a character from the front, his work falls to pieces a little. The features end up very weirdly placed. Thankfully, his actual animation is pretty good, though he makes a weird mistake with Goku's hair, drawing it in its Super Saiyan 2 shape, despite everything before and after his section featuring the regular hair. I imagine he probably pulled up the wrong character sheet for reference. It's not the first time someone's done that. For example, back in episode 50, Masahiro Shimanuki accidentally drew Goku with Super Saiyan 1 hair, where the cuts before and after were in Super Saiyan 2. Not the end of the world, but I know it's caused a lot of confusion among the fans. The half ends with a very nicely drawn close-up of Vegeta, and I feel like it's the perfect way to demonstrate the difference between well-drawn and on-model, and Takahashi bringing back the old-school designs. As soon as the second half kicks in, the difference is astounding. In my coverage of episode 114, I went over all of the differences between the new and old, so I won't repeat them again, but I feel like just comparing these two well-drawn but stylistically very different shots speaks volumes on their own. I also want to give a quick shout out to Takahashi's Whis, which is just the best drawing ever since Shuichi Yuseki's efforts back on episode 16. It's so cool to see new characters with classic traits. Takahashi's action kicks off with Vegeta launching a flurry of punches at Jiren. This particular section is rather limited in its movement with a focus on looped frames of gorgeous art. It reminds me a lot of Kazuya Hisada's work on Z, which would often utilize similar techniques. It's snappy, very fast, and emphasized with a lot of speed lines. When he moves from this limited movement into full animation, not only is it remarkably well done, but it utilizes Shida's storyboard to the max. You've got a whole bunch of great impact frames before it moves into this rhythmic timing that holds on key poses, much like Shida's own work is known for. This is all tied together with a nice bit of vertical action and of course a whole bunch of tasty effects. The next section has Dispo hilariously pulling Freezer around by the tail. The animation here is serviceable though mostly driven by its art. The only reason I bring this section up is because you can see some parallels with Shida's last storyboard where Kaba is thrown into the rocks and Freezer grabs his face. It's a nice throwback and a funny little bit of visual comeuppance. Toppo vs Gohan comes next, and this is probably my favourite bit of animation in this episode. The effects and the remarkable sense of speed are just lovely, and the Kamehameha is another example that Takahashi is totally unrivaled when it comes to betraying the force of a beam. Funnily enough, it's actually inspired by Naoto Shishida's work on Dragon Ball Z Movie 8. You can see the shading and general layout is identical. In fact, when I was DMing with Takahashi the other week, he was saying that he's most inspired by movies 8, 12, and 13, so this isn't too surprising. It's great to see so much dedication to Dragon Ball's roots here. Seeing Takahashi's Super Saiyan Blue Goku with all of its gorgeous flowing hair compared to the usual Lego look is probably my favourite example of this. Moving away from Takahashi for a bit, sort of. Vegeta's final flash is animated by Chu Young Sir, though obviously corrected by Takahashi pretty heavily. I think there's only really one scene where his normal artwork slips out from under those corrections. It's an absolutely fantastic scene that really demonstrates the man's strength in his effects work. By his own self-admission, he did say the movement is quite limited and that he focused on the effects, but with how strong this scene is anyway, I can't really complain. He said he learned a lot under Takahashi's supervision too, which is just wonderful to hear. In the past, he's also said he learned a great deal from Naoki Tate and Naoto Shishida, and I really admire that about him. I was asked to take part in Sakuga Blog's 2017 awards, and I gave Chu the Animator Discovery of the Year accolade because of stuff like this. He's incredibly driven and very humble. I'll leave a link in the description to that article if you're interested. It was a lot of fun, and you might discover some shows that you maybe hadn't heard of before. But this episode here wraps up with some gorgeous art of everyone before Vegeta gets blasted away, and I feel like that's a perfect way to wrap up my thoughts on Takahashi's work as a supervisor. His work is remarkably detailed, but as Vegeta gets blasted by Jiren, you get an absurdly cartoony and over-the-top expression, and that just solidifies him as one of my favourite staff on the series. When you can bring about both detail, exaggeration, and impressive movement all within a single half, you deserve all of the praise in the world. And you know what's even more mind-blowing? He revealed that he put together this half in about five weeks, which is 
is only two more than what he had on 114. He is an absolute speed demon. This episode really came together. The director, Takahiro Imamura, is usually very hit and miss, but thankfully he was 100% on point in this episode and nailed the tone just right, picking out the best music for each scene and ultimately ensuring everything landed as it should. What a relief. I wish I could say the same about the new ending, but unfortunately I think this may well be the worst Super has had so far. Not only is it incredibly bland, but Tadayoshi Yamamura's artwork is especially poor. The final shot of Goku and Vegeta has really amateur construction issues. I'm a little embarrassed for him. Vegeta in particular has that dreadful gremlin hunch that he drew Goku with on the recent cover of V-Jump. Goku's arms and shoulders are far too small for the rest of his body, and the foreshortening is just all kinds of broken. I know Yamamura is not as good as he used to be, but even putting that aside, this whole ending just feels so so rushed. There is possibly a good reason for this, so keep an eye on my channel over the next few days for my staff coverage video for the next month's worth of episodes. It's pretty interesting. But that is it for now. What a fantastic episode to kick off the new year. I'm so interested to see what this final battle will bring us animation-wise. For once, I actually have a lot of faith that the staff will deliver on our expectations. But let me know how you enjoyed this episode and what your expectations are for this final battle. Be sure to rate the video and subscribe if you're new. And as always, I will see you next time.